Welcome to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada's webcast called Acute Myeloid Leukemia, Diagnosis and Treatment in 2020. In this presentation, Dr. Florian Kuchenbauer will explain modern approaches to classification and treatment of acute myeloid leukemia. He will further discuss clinical trials that change treatment paradigms and explain how research opens new treatment avenues. This interactive and easy to understand webcast is aimed at patients, relatives, friends, and everybody who is interested in acute myeloid leukemia. My name is Sonia Mudo, Community Program Coordinator for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada. I will be the host of this online event. During the webcast, you will hear only my voice and the speaker's voice. Since there are many of you, Questions may be asked at the end, but only online using the question or chat function. The presentation will last approximately 45 minutes and will be followed by a 15 to 20 minute question period. The presentation is also being recorded. Therefore, you, you will be able to listen to it again on our website while following along with the PowerPoint presentation. We will send you an email when the recording is available. Our mission is to cure blood cancers and improve the quality of life for patients and their families. We offer support to people affected by blood cancer every step of the way. Please reach out to us if need be. We have several informative tools such as fact sheets and booklets available on our website, llscanada.org. We also have a series of educational videos also accessible on our website. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Florian Kuchenbauer. He is a clinical scientist at the Leukemia Bone Marrow Transplant Program of BC and Terry Fox Lab of BC Cancer. He is also an associate professor in medicine at the University of British Columbia. Over to you, Dr. Kuchenbauer. Hi everybody, this is Frank Kuchenbauer speaking about acute myeloid leukemia today. Um, topic of our talk today is diagnosis and treatment in 2020. And um, I apologize already that I have this strong German accent, but we try to make this rare disease even more exotic by sounding like it. So I will give you an introduction about leukemias as the first uh, in part one. And further on, I will talk about treatment, I will talk about classifications and research. And overall, what you should take home by this presentation is, is to get a better understanding how leukemia arises, how we classify it, what are the treatment options we have, and also like how we look at leukemia from a research perspective to introduce new treatments and also open up new treatment avenues for the future. Let's start with cancers in Canada. If you look at cancers in Canada, this is a distribution from 2016. Um, you can see that most blood cancers have actually only a small part, it's, it's 11%. The big cancer groups are breast, colorectal, lung, and then all others which are combined in this figure here. Um, I want to focus on blood cancers today. And, and if you break this down in different blood cancers, you can see that Leukemia is one third of it, but most of the blood cancers are actually lymphomas. So for example, so is chronic lymphocytic leukemia, the most frequent blood cancer in the world. However, today we're gonna to focus on leukemia. And if you break down the group of leukemia patients, you can see that acute myeloid leukemia is just a small part. It's, it's only one fourth of, all, of the population of leukemia patients. It's mainly, as I mentioned, it's chronic lymphocytic leukemia, a small part, and, and we are talking about adults here, is acute lymphocytic leukemia, and we also have chronic myeloid leukemia. The incidence of acute myeloid leukemia overall is, is two to four per 100,000 people, and this is the focus of our talk today. Question is now, usually a question that I frequently get is like, what are, what are my chances of survival if I have leukemia? And it's kind of interesting if you compare different countries and continents, you can see that the overall survival varies between here, this is a publication coming out of Germany, 
where the authors compared Germany versus the United States, you can see that the overall survival in Germany is, is close to 23%, and this is the five-year um, overall survival, whereas it's in the US, it's, it's close to 19%. You can also see, if you look at the left-hand side of this, of this graph here, you can see that um, the numbers increase with age. So on the left-hand side, you have different age groups, starting with young patients, and ending in, in patients that are above 70 years, 75 years old. You can see that leukemia is, a, is increasing with age. The overall um, survival in Canada is around 22%, so it's very close to Germany. And the reason for, for that low number is, so first of all, we have, and you will see this, there's a dramatic development in, in new drugs, and these drugs are not everywhere um, available. Then what I learned when I came to Vancouver is logistics. Logistics matter a lot. So here in Vancouver, or like in Canada, it's a, it's a big country. So British Columbia has the size of Germany, but in Germany, we have 80 million people and lots of hospitals. So the interconnections between hospitals and also um, hematologists is, is, is easier than having a huge um, area where you, which is covered mainly by, by Vancouver. As mentioned before, leukemia, especially AML, is a disease of the elderly population. You can see that with increasing age, um, leukemia dramatically rises in its incidence. So typically, the typical peak is, is, um, is between 60 and 80 years. So these are most of the patients we see. However, leukemia can also be, is also present in, in younger patients. So you also can see that the actual rise is in leukemias is, just a second, is starting already in 30s. So we, 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 see, we frequently see patients that are like 30 to 50 years old and who also develop acute myeloid leukemia. Interestingly, um, the age determines outcome, and this has uh, different reasons, and I will later talk about the treatment of AML in elderly patients, but if you look at this graph and the, the way to read these graphs, it's, it's, it's very busy, but on the left-hand side, you see the percent overall survival. So 100% is basically everybody's alive, and you can see the overall survival interval. So um, after how many people are alive after one year to 10 years? You can see, depending on the age group, so the very young patients that are like below 20 years, which is where leukemia, especially AML, is rare. Um, when you compare this, for example, to patients that are between 65 and plus 75, you can see there's a dramatic difference, especially after five years. And that's, this is usually our mark. 50, more than 50% are alive when patients are young, but barely anybody's alive when, when, when you're in this age group. And there are several reasons for this. However, to, to understand this, why leukemia arises in elderly patients and, and what kind of treatment options we have and why there's such a big difference between overall survival and onset of leukemia, um, it's important to look at the pathophysiology of acute myeloid leukemia. Basically, we, um, how does leukemia develop and what are the factors that determine which leukemia it is? In this slide, you see an overview of the bone marrow. And the bone marrow is actually the site where all the blood is produced. And the way you have to look at it is it's a very complex environment, which is embedded in each bone. So here, it's not only the femur as, as shown here, it's also like in your vertebrae or in your, in your um, bones in your head. So you can find it anywhere. So blood production is happening throughout the whole body. The output is very high. So per day, 500 billion blood cells are produced. So this means this is a highly active organ and, and, and it needs a lot of, and a lot of factors contribute to the actual production. So for example, um, the output of, the, of production results in different cells. And, and when you look at this photo here of the bone marrow, you can see that it's, it's, we call it a very colorful picture. So you see different cells and different sizes with different shapes and different colors. And this is because bone marrow, the bone marrow is a very um, vibrant environment. And the way it works is everything is based around a hematopoietic stem cell. And, and you can imagine the bone marrow as, as like a beehive. You have a queen, and from this queen, all the workers derive. 
But once you lose the queen or the queen um, leaves the hive, basically the whole tribe dies. And this is, this is how it happens. And this is basically what happens in the boma. So you have a hematopoietic stem cell. And from this cell, we have progenitor, progenitor cells, which are cells that are still primitive, but they're already committed to a certain lineage. Then you have all these progenitor cells. And at the end, you get mature blood cells that appear in the peripheral blood and in the bone marrow. These are the cells that do the actual work, such as like supporting the immune system or blood clotting, or as for erythrocytes, carrying out oxygen. And this is very important to keep in mind because leukemia arises from this complex, um, from this complex procedure. It's, it, it's clear that this is, a, this is a very simplified figure. It's actually more complex to how it, how it actually works and not all the steps are known so far. We do a lot of research, especially like Connie Eves does a lot of research on how hematopoietic stem cells work and how their output is regulated, but still there's lots of work, of work to be done for, for that. When you look at AML, um, we learned within the last um, 30 or 20 to 30 years that acute myeloid leukemia develops um, from immature white blood cells. So at the very top of this picture, you have a hematopoietic stem cell, which is the most primitive cell. It's again, it's the, it's the queen of all hematopoietic cells. And from there, we have a common myeloid progenitor cell. So this is a cell which is already biased to produce either erythrocytes, platelets, granulocytes, or macrophages. And these are the, and this is basically, this is the white blood cell count we are measuring. And from these progenitors, more committed progenitors derive and from them mature blood cells arrive. So something, the way we imagine that leukemia um, arises is it's actually not always in the most primitive cell because these cells are hidden in the bone marrow and we don't have a lot of them. They, and, and, they are, and there's a reason why they're hidden because they have to be protected from different influences. It's actually the more uh, committed cells, the progenitor cells. And when these cells have acquired some genetic defects, which we call mutations, or um, have some other, undergo some other changes that eventually lead to a modification of their, of how they work, what could happen is that they result in uncontrolled cell growth, which you call sever, sever new, or which you call proliferation in scientific terms. So, and this uncontrolled cell growth, usually cells are regulated by itself. So, so they can grow, 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 and then they die off at some point. It's like aging. But cancer is characterized by uncontrolled cell growth and proliferation, so these cancer cells can accumulate. But the other thing that happens is that these cells actually do not mature into white blood cells. So at the end, you end up with immature cells that grow but have no function. They just fill up the bone marrow and push, us, push aside all the, all the healthy cells. So it's... and and. And this is a very nice picture here. So on the left-hand side, again, you see a bone marrow with a polymorph, meaning like it's, it's consisting of different shapes, different cells, different colors. The, the nucleus are in different shapes. You can see the, um, you can see like big cells, small cells, and so on. So it's a very vibrant environment, as I mentioned before. But when leukemia arises, you can see these monomorph blasts, and I've labeled them here. You can see blasts here, here, here. So they're filling up the bone marrow, and there are very few, for example, neutrophils, as you can see here or here. It's, it's becoming monomorphic, and these cells take over, and this is basically what we define as, um, in this case, acute myeloid leukemia. And the original de definition um, is there's a, if, there's more, if there are more than 20 or like 20% of blasts in the bone marrow, just by looking at them in the micro microscope, um, we call it acute myeloid leukemia. And based on these observations, so um, people try to classify acute myeloid leukemia. And when you go back to the 60s and 70s, um, what people did is they took blood or bone marrow from a patient and looked at it um, through the microscope. And based on the si size, the shape, and also the color and the distribution, like the ratio between the nucleus and the cytoplasm of a cell, they defined um, different maturation stages and which they summarized in the French American British classification, which was established in 1976. And M stands for morphology. So it's morphology zero up to morphology seven. And these are all distinct classes. 
But what's really important, so first of all, these classes are usually, um, there's not a strong association with outcome. And the other thing is, it really depends on the people who looks into the microscope, who makes the actual diagnosis. So you have to be experienced to, to do that properly. And um, there were like experiments where, where they gave the same slide to different experts of the field. And then they got like, you get five experts, you get five opinions. So, so this is sometimes a little bit harder to do and it's not very objective. And, and that's what we actually need to, to classify leukemias. So a different way of looking into this is when genetics, meaning that we can actually look inside leukemic cells and see how their how their information is processed. Do they have genetic defects? Is their information the same as a healthy cell? Yes or no? Like these things became more prevalent in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and eventually the World and the World Health Organization picked it up and um, formed a classification out of it. And when you compare the WHO classification from 2012, you can see that there's leukemia with a translocation 821. So this means like, and I will show a picture of that later. And this means that the, these chromosomes exchange parts of each other. And there are other translocations, but it's only like five different ones. When you look at 2016, this list is much longer now of the ones which have either mutations or translocations. So and this will become even longer once we, um, with the next classification, which will come out most likely in, in 2020 or 2021. Sequencing approaches and show that leukemia, and this is, and, and this is why this classification is so important to develop it even more, is that acute myeloukemia is not a single disease. It's, 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 it's a group of diseases. So it's kind of the same thing when I, when I ask you, like, what kind of car do you drive? They say like, well, I drive a Mercedes, and um, that's my German answer. And then I wouldn't still know what kind of car it is. Is it a convertible? Is it an SUV? Does it have automatic transmission? Is it black? Is it silver? Is it white? Is it um, a fast car, a slow car? And this is exactly the same way how we look at leukemias. So we try to put them into individual doors. We really try to classify them to figure out what leukemia is growing in this particular patient. Unfortunately, our classification is ahead of treatment options, and you will see this later, because ideally we would like to have for each leukemia a specific treatment, and that's what we are aiming at, and that's what we're working on. But classifications are much easier to do than, than finding treatments for that. But you can see here in this, in this, in this pie chart that we have more than 15 different classifications and genetic subtypes of AML, and this is really, um, and this is really, and this is really um, complicated. But it also makes it necessary that we do proper diagnosis. One way of looking into this, because we learned that genetic abnormalities also determine the risk category. So this is a classification um, from the European Leukemia Net. And what they did, and this is different compared to the WHO classification, where they were just listed as different groups. Here, the authors tried, based on treatment outcomes, tried to classify leukemias um, into favorable, intermediate, and adverse risk groups. Basically, if you have, for example, if you carry an 821 translocation here, you are, your outcome is, is better than having a, for example, a complex karyotype or an inversion three. So this is really important for us because we also have to, we have to stratify not only how intense we have to like, that we have to treat patients more intense or can we treat them less intense? And this is important um, to know. The most frequent group in here is the um, intermediate group where the normal karyotype, meaning like they have no, these patients have no, they have no translocation. They have maybe molecular mutations, but there's no major translocation defining this group. This is the most frequent group with above like 50%. And here, this is a good picture showing that how these gene fusions, these, these genetic categories actually influence outcome. 
And the way, the way to read this graph, again, here, this is probably of survival. So this 1.0 is 100% alive, and this and 0 0.2 is 20% alive. And you can see that patients that carry an inversion 16 or like in 15, 17 translocation, which is myelocytic leukemia, or the, the mentioned A21 location, the outcome is different compared to somebody who has an inversion 3. The outcome is dismal, and this is really important. But also in the ones that have, for example, um, that have no gene fusions but have mutations, like an IDH2 mutation or an MPN1 mutation, is, which is the most frequent group in here, um, the outcome changes a lot. So for us, it's really important at the beginning to establish a proper diagnosis of what the patient, what the patient actually has. The challenge here is that, um, and that's something that has come up within the last decades, is that AML cells, when you look at one patient, all these cells look the same, but it's very difficult to figure out which one is the, which one is the queen and which one is the worker. So here I, I show you a couple of cells from a patient, and these are AML cells. You may, they look all the same, but they're not. So we have leukemic stem cells, which, are, which is the malignant pendant to, to hematopoietic stem cells. So this is basically the, uh, the leukemia B, the killer B basically, that produces, and then there's the workers, which are the leukemic cells, which are almost 100% of the cells. So the leukemic stem cells are very rare, but eventually when you wanna treat leukemia, it's important not only to kill off the leukemic cells, it's actually important to kill off um, and target leukemic stem cells because when they remain, they, they, people usually relapse. And this is really important to keep in mind. So leukemia, especially acute myeloid leukemia, is a stem cell disease. So in summary, um, I showed you that the incidence of, of acute myeloid leukemia is, is four in 100,000 people, so it's actually a rare disease. It's a disease um, mainly of the elderly population, but age is unfortunately is, is impacting on outcome. Leukemia, as I just showed, is a stem cell disease. So you have different groups within one patient. And ideally, you would like to get rid of all of them. And if just a few cells remain, this can cause relapses. Very, very important to mention is that AMA is a genetically heterogeneous disease, meaning that you um, do not even have not every AML is the same. It's think about the car comparison. It's it's very different. The current classification we use is the WHO classification, and it it relies on it's kind of a mix of FAB and 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 genetics, which is important, and this will increase over time. And it's very important to keep in mind that genetics determine outcome. So our goal is to find for each subgroup a specific treatment. This is basically where research is heading, but it's not so simple. So to determine the proper treatment, we have to find, you have to actually get a diagnosis. So often it's like this, I get calls to the emergency room that somebody has, for example, high white blood cell count, and usually, and then we have to figure out what's wrong. I mean, it could be an infection, could be something malignant, could be also something non-malignant. So this is, is, is tricky. And usually at the beginning, patients present with very unspecific symptoms. Usually patients present to their GP or with um, fatigue, or they are like, have some chronic inflammations, or they're often sick. So it's very hard to actually to figure out that this is, that there's an underlying leukemia, because leukemia is rare. And, and so this bears a, like, is a challenge for, for the treating physicians to do the right thing. When you see a patient, usually the most important thing is actually to talk and look at a patient, so the clinical assessment. So this is what I was told in medical school, look at a patient, touch a patient, talk to a patient, right? And this is, is the basis for everything else, because people will tell you what's wrong with them, but you have to ask, and you have to give them time to talk about it. So very unspecific things are night sweats, weight loss, fever, then how do you do when you, for example, climb stairs? Do you have like a shortness of breath? Can you, do you feel like weak? Do you easily bruise? So these are things that make you aware of what is actually happening. And this is very important to do so, especially at early stage of disease onset. And then the next thing, and this is a really cheap way of, of looking at it, is to do a blood smear and a differential blood count. So differential blood count will tell you 
like is do we have a high um, or a low both ways happens in leukemia white blood cell count or is the patient anemic meaning the hemoglobin levels are low which would for example explain fatigue or what are the platelets are the platelets levels low so this would also explain for example easy bruises so when you look at a blood smear and this is a very thing you, easy thing you can do you can do it day and night and 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 get can come at least to a initial diagnosis relatively quickly on the left hand side you can see a healthy blood smear where you have red blood cells here these are the red ones then you have neutrophils which are which are granulocytes these little um purple dots are platelets so this is how a normal one, uh, normal one looks like when you look at anal patients you ideally you see blasts right so here, this is more prevalent, but sometimes you have to look even more and it takes some time to, to look at blood smears to evaluate them properly. So these are these monomorphic cells. They all look the same. They don't look nice. They're not much, they're very immature. These are, this is what we call blasts, immature um, leukemia cells. And the next thing is, and this is the least popular um, way of diagnosing leukemia, but it's the most important one, is actually doing a bone aspiration. Um, and in combination with the biopsy, uh, reason is so. This used to this this used to be even less um, popular than it is today because how it was done initially was in your sternum. So you can imagine you're lying on your back and somebody. I mean, in my case, I'm, I don't have a lot of hair and I have a German accent and like bending over and say like, "Girl, I'm gonna poke you in the sternum." It's not a nice thing to be. So so this shifted towards doing it in your hip. And this is a very safe way, though it's still uncomfortable, way of getting a biopsy and getting an idea how the bone marrow looks like and eventually getting a, a diagnosis. And usually what we take is a Yamshini needle so we can do like an aspiration here and we can also get a biopsy at the same time. So this is really good. And what you do is patient either lies on his, his or her side or on, on his or her belly, and then you can access the upper um, right or left part of your hip bone, which is thick and, and basically barely has any side effects except for like pain and, and a bruise. Um, but it's, it's very uncomfortable, I agree. But you can do a lot of things with what you get from there. And um, you can do, the easiest thing of course is microscopy. So you look at it, see, compare how does this bone marrow look like? You can do um, cytochemistry. For example, you can stain for myeloid markers just to get an idea. Is this more like a myeloid or lymphoid disease? You can do flow cytometry, and I will explain this later, but this will give us, it's also like a relatively quick method to give us an idea about, is this a lymphoid or myeloid disease? Because this can be sometimes tricky because acute lymphoblastic or acute myeloid leukemia can look the same. Then eventually you will do molecular genetics. This takes longer, this takes days, and cytogenetics, which can sometimes take longer than a week to get those. But this will, all this information you gather from these investigations, you um, will help you to eventually tell, figure out what kind of leukemia subtype it is. And that's why this is really important to do. This, for example, is a typical example of um, cytogenetics. And, um, these things here are human chromosomes. Here is a duplicate, so usually we have one. This is chromosome one, this is chromosome seven, eight, 21, and these are the gender specific chromosomes, so the Y and the X chromosomes. So this is a male carrier type, that's how we call it. So what we're looking for is um, are pieces missing and are there gains? So you can see, and this is a ML patient with a translocation 821. And here you can see at chromosome eight, there's a piece missing. And then you're like, oh God, where's this piece here? And I, I've done this myself and during my training and it's, it's a major pain in the butt actually to, to, to look at these karyotypes. It takes a lot of art and a lot of knowledge to do so. And you can see that this part here is glued to, to chromosome 21. And based on that, we, we conclude this is a translocation 821. And this is important because it will tell us, okay, this is um, a favorable risk group so this patient might get a different treatment than somebody who is in the adverse risk group. And even more modern is to combine, we sequence the genome of these leukemia cells. Basically, this is, a, this is something we most centers do. They either send it off to a place that specialized in doing so, or they do, the, do it themselves. And this is another piece of information about the genetics of the disease. And, it, and this 
combining molecular information with cytogenetics eventually will result in these AML subtypes. And we are able to tell you exactly, is this in A21 translocation? We said like, yes. But now we have to know, okay, where is the exact mutation? Is it a subtype of this translocation? I mean, this is, you can see that, like, you can see that, for example, APL, which is considered as APL with a, with a typical 15 cent heat translocation, has different subtypes. Or, um, or like MPN1 mutated leukemias, which usually do not have a, a specific translocation, you can see that you have like eight different subtypes. And this will even increase um, the better our diagnostics um, develop over time. Within the next few slides, I wanna focus on APL on T1517, because I think it's a, it's a very good example how research can change the outcome of acute myeloquemia treatment. Initially, this disease was described in 1957 by, by Mr. Dr. Hillstadt, and he reported three cases um, of AML patients, which were odd at the time. And he looked at them and said, like, well, they, there's several features that stand out. First thing is that they look very, um, they look very typical for, for, for a leukemia. So it, this was a very distinct group just based on morphology. And these, look, these cells look like promyelocytes. And this is a part of the, um, it's one part of the developmental stages from a, from a hematopoietic stem cell to a granulocyte. So these leukemias basically stop the differentiation on the promyelocyte level. And the other thing is from a clinical point of view, these patients had a really, really bad prognosis due to severe bleedings and also thrombosis. So they had both ways. So this was a is a is a pro, this was a problem, and these leukemias until like the early 90s were um, the worst leukemias of all because patients, especially at the onset of treatment, um, died from complications, which were like thrombosis, bleedings, and they were really hard to treat. However, research kind of figured out what is the underlying cause of this leukemia. And uh, almost all of these patients have a translocation 1517. And what this means is that chromosome, between chromosome 15 and chromosome 17 is a, a fusion, like an exchange occurs. And RARA actually means retinoic, and retinoic acid receptor alpha, which is basically vitamin A. Um, and this was really interesting because in the early nine, like late 80s, researchers realized, okay, if this is related to vitamin A, why don't we give vitamin A to patients? Can we maybe cure this leukemia or like help support treatment? And nowadays, based on this, and I will tell you in a second, this is the leukemia with the best outcome. It has the best prognosis because the low and intermediate risk groups, we can actually treat chemo-free, meaning we don't give them these patients classic chemotherapy anymore. What you do is we give them um, ATO and ATRA, and ATRA is Altrans retinoic acid, so it's vitamin A, and, and ATO is arsen trioxide. So it's also a very old medicine, which you can find um, already in ancient China, where they treated tumors with that. So and it was rediscovered, and eventually you can see from the survival plot that patients with low and intermediate risk APL and 60 months is five years, they are still almost all of them alive. So the overall prognosis is 95% is of being alive after five years. And reason is what happens is in these patients, when you give ATRA, the blasts, these leukemic cells and the switchback, these promyelocytes, they are actually pushed towards differentiation, towards becoming granulocytes, these leukemic cells. And this makes it easier to, to kill them off either with chemotherapy or with ATO. This can occur, this can lead for, like, this can make problems, especially uh, something that we call differentiation syndrome, which is sparking and um, differentiation of these cells, which can derange the coagulation parameters of a patient. But overall, once you basically survive the first two, three weeks the initial treatment, you have a very, very good prognosis. And this was a paradigm change of like how to treat leukemias. And that's what we are still thriving at, to find for each leukemia something that kind of pushes leukemias or leukemic cells 
towards a normal cell that we can, or normal-ish cell, that we can kill off with chemotherapy to make current treatments um, much more effective. And this is the second summary of my talk. So you can see that the way to approach this is to have a clinical assessment to differential or blood counts. So this will allow us, especially on weekends or the classic Friday night leukemia when it comes into the hospital, to initiate a treatment to know, is this a myeloid or lymphoid leukemia? Or, and most important is, is this an APL and acute promyelocytic leukemia? Because those always have to receive ATRA. And if you just have the slightest suspicion that this is an APL, the one I just talked about, then you have to start ATRA, like giving vitamin A to these patients. It doesn't have any major side effects and it's in, it's important for the treatment and you can always stop it. And then of course you need to do a bone marrow aspirate um, followed by microscopy, genetics, flow cytometry to determine the actual AML subtype and this will impact on prognosis and treatment. So the next part of my talk is gonna be treatment of leukemias. And I think this is where um, most people are interested in. And this is just a little summary of um, treatment principles. And this here is mainly for fit patients. So usually what we do is to start with chemotherapy followed by consolidation. And then it used to be, there used to be maintenance treatments, but um, in many patients, at least 50 or 40%, they receive a stem cell transplant. The idea is eventually to get rid of, or like to decrease the tumor burden and then to be tumor free. And here, this, this didn't copy well, but um, what I want to show you is that the treat, induction treatment, seven plus three, as we call it, was is actually has been around for a long time. So, so um, the first time it was described and, and used as a treatment for AML patients was in 1975. So this has been around for decades and we're still doing it. This is still the standard of care. And the first clinical trial involving it was done in 1981, where since when we actually used the actual treatment as we do now. And the complete remission rates in, in younger patients below 60 years, that's how we define younger patients, is between 60 and 80 percent, whereas the complete remission rates in, in elderly patients is, is lower. And 7 plus 3 means this is cytarabin for seven days and donorubicin and anthocycline for three days. That's why we call it like this. As I said, this is the standard of care. We're usually giving 60 milligrams of donorubicins on days one to three, cytarabin, um, depending on the protocol, for seven days. And it needs um, a lot of supportive care. So first of all, it's an inpatient setting. You need a central IV line. You have to, you need some tumor lysis prophylaxis. So it's very important to have a lot of hydration and, and also give a lot of allopurinol. And you need, because you're immunocompromised, you need a um, herpesimplex prophylaxis and some antifungal prophylaxis. And the period of meroplasia is, is approximately 21 to, to 25 days. And this is the, a period where you have neutropenia, where you have uh, th thrombocytopenia, and where you need blood transfusions to overcome this. Toxicities are, of course, as I said, you're transfusion dependent infections. So, so you're basically, you're opening the gates for even more infections in your body. So you have to be, we have to, you have to do this to be careful when you do that. It has to be done by experienced doctors or experienced centers. Nausea vomiting, I mean, this is uh, supportive care for these kind of things has dramatically improved, but this is still an issue. Also like diarrhea and mucositis. Um, you, you lose your hair and um, you, have, you can have severe organ toxicity, meaning like it can affect the liver, it can affect your heart and skin. And the induction mortality within the first Two month is five to ten percent. Late toxicity is basically you, we if we we have an early toxicity where we damage an organ and then it carries on, or um, it's mainly affecting your heart. Fertility is a big issue, so this should be discussed ahead of treatment. And then it called can also cause like neurological, but also like in terms of it can cause depression. You're in the hospital, you feel sick, you need support. It can also, but it can also cause um, economic issues for patients because you cannot work during this time, obviously. And then you have to have like a good social network to kind of um, catch you. The next thing, so cytarabin as a, as a consolidation treatment is that's what I've been doing for you for decades now. And there are different doses depending on age and, and where you're located. 
numbers of cycles are two to four cycles. Um, usually we, it's a single treatment. So there were trials where they combined cytarabine with other, um, with other drugs and medications to make this a more intense treatment, but it didn't prove any advantage. And toxicities for high dose um, thyroid are conjunctivitis. So basically, you you have inflammations of your eyes. You can have like some, you can have some some brain toxicity, which is reversible. Um, mucositis is typical. Infections and fever, and you, it can also affect your liver. Just to give you like, I mean, we have had these old drugs, and and we have been using them for decades now. But just to give you some heads up for. I mean, there's lots happening in the AML field. And this is a table that shows what has been FDA approved since, since April 2017. And you can see there are um, eight new drugs that have been approved. And the last one was gilteritinib in, in just a year ago. And these are all drugs that are, um, most of them are available. And these are all drugs either for the initial treatment for newly diagnosed AML patients or may, the, most of them are in the refractory or relapse setting. And I, for example, mitostorin is now the standard treatment for patients with a flat three mutation. So also here you can see how important it is to determine the subtype. And these are all um, drugs that are available through, either through clinical trials, and then I'm talking now about MPC, or through compassionate access programs. So most of them you can get, but um, still, as I said, these all have been FDA approved, but um, this doesn't mean that they are available in Canada. So this is also another reason why, and, and treatment has to, be, has to be done, if it's in clinical trials, it has to be done in a big center. So also here logistics and um, play a big role to have access to these, to these, to these drugs. A word to, um, towards more experimental treatments, but nonetheless, I think treatments of the future and that have a big, big potential. These are immunotherapies, and and here this is the new like the time cover from 2016 where they had published a big article about how immunotherapies work, and and also they looked at the industry of it, and it, this was really insightful because immunotherapies are expensive to to produce, the, and, then, and they're of course expensive then to treat patients. So the mother of all immunotherapies is actually the allergenic stem cell transplantation. And this is something we have been doing for um, over 50 years now because the first transplantation was performed um, in 1957. We currently do about a hundred allergenic transplantations, meaning we have the donor is not the patient, it's actually somebody else. And the age limit has drastically changed. So at the beginning, they wouldn't transplant patients that are above 40 years old. And this was like decades ago. Nowadays, there is barely any limit. So, so we, we, depending on the fitness of the patient, and we do transplantations in patients above 70 years, actually. So the way it works is the following. So the, the problem is that, and this is something that is similar for all tumors in a very simplistic way, is that Tumors usually, like everybody develops cancer cells throughout their lifespan. But these cancer cells are recognized by your immune system through um, the immune cells, and then they're taken out of the system, they're killed off. So cancer doesn't spread and doesn't arise. However, some cancer cells are actually smart and they mutate and, and, and they basically put on like an invisible cloak. So they're not recognized by the immune system anymore. So they can actually arise and develop and spread in the body and are still unrecognized by the immune system, which is kind of the police of the body. So the idea of immune therapies is either to exchange the immune system and thus making these cancers again vulnerable against immune cells, or um, to enhance the existing immune system to make them help recognize cancer cells again. And allergenic stem cell transplantation is a way where we try to exchange the immune system. So it's a, it's a combination of giving chemotherapy and giving a new bone marrow. And this bone marrow will produce immune cells and these immune cells then kill off leukemic cells. And this is a long, and we call this a graft versus leukemia effect. So basically if you're the patient, you receive chemotherapy and radiation to get rid of your existing immune system and existing leukemic cells. And then there's a donor who gives either bone marrow or peripheral blood to mobilize stem cells that are infused into the uh, patient 
And then there is like this thing we want to prevent is called graft versus host disease, because unfortunately, these new immune cells, they are not only attacking cancer cells, which they should, but they can also attack normal cells. And this can cause a lot of severe side effects. And this can be so extreme that you actually cure the leukemia, but then you have major problems or can even die from, from the side effects of this treatment. So that's why this has to be done at really experienced centers and cannot be done by, by any doctor or a hospital. So what are the things we want to balance and what are we to work on in, in allergen stem cell transplantations? So this is, first of all, we want to have a low risk of relapse. So we don't want the disease to come back, but we also want to have like Low toxicity, and this is what we have to balance. Toxicity is, is determined by comorbidities, performance, and donor characteristics, and risk of relapse is determined um, by the subtype of leukemia and, and age in response to treatment. So these are the things we, we have to look at, and that's what we always discuss in our patient, in the patient rounds when we say, okay, how do we treat and how do we transplant this, this patient? And you can see that the outcomes are actually not too bad. So this is um, this is from the um, US side. This is statistics showing that if you catch an AML early and you're at an early stage creating a good tumor clearance, then the outcome is pretty good. So five-year survival rates are around 60%. But if you have advanced disease and transplant somebody, and this is just an example for somebody who has maybe a brother or a sister, and then they use these siblings and these siblings might match as donor, advanced disease, the outcome is, is, is much worse. So it also depends on which stage of your disease you are. If you're in your first complete remission, this is much better than having like a late complete remission where the disease has already evolved throughout the treatments. The other thing, question we always get is like CAR T cells. What about CAR T cells and acute myeloid leukemia? And you can see that in the way CAR T cells work is basically you take your own immune cells, in this case T cells, you change the you manipulate these T cells when you take extract them from the body to make them recognize again leukemic cells. Then you expand them and then you reinfuse them to the patients. So here you don't have this graft versus host disease, um, but you're relying that these T cells are modified. They're like kind of like fighting dogs that have been made really like aggressive and they're given back to a patient that these kind of sniff out leukemic cells and kill them off in your body. And what's really good about it, it's a tailored treatment. It's, it's highly effective. It has some side effects, but we are able to manage them better and better. But it's a very expensive uh, treatment and it's only limited, limited availability is very limited for, for patients right now. So most of the CASISA's treatments arise from, arose from, or were founded in lymphoid diseases. So there are very, actually there, there are trials for AML, but you can see that these are mainly phase one trials. Many of them are either in the US or in China. So they are very early trials. And you can also see that it's a challenge to have different, which target, what kind of protein on the AML cell do you take, do you use as a target for the lymphocytes to attack? And you can see that there are different targets. There's CD123, there are there's CD33, there are um, UCAR, like so different targets. It's not really clear what is the best target. So all these trials will show in there and there's very little literature in terms of re reported trials, bigger trials, only case reports are available so far. So AM, CAR T cells for AML, far behind lymphoid diseases. So, so they're, they're not that close to reality yet. So these are all early trials. It's very hard to find the perfect target for different AML subtypes. That's the other thing because we have so many different layers of AML, so many different subtypes. So you can imagine that one AML subtype maybe does not express a certain target and the other one does. So you cannot really give CAR T cells to anybody and, and every patient the same way. It has, the other thing is that these targets, because AML cells resemble normal hematopoietic cells, you will also often kill off hematopoietic stem cells. So you need a stem cell transplant afterwards to compensate for that. And we will see, time will tell. I'm pretty sure that this will be an available treatment, but the data for the first trials is, is still like to be seen. The other thing is, and this is something more experimental, is you basically, instead of taking out your T cells and then making them, priming them against AML cells, what you can do is you take a bite antibody. This is a, you basically take a protein that couples your T cell to the tumor cell. 
So you basically you try to catch them and then to connect them so that the T cell says, hey, here, this is a tumor cell, kill it off. And these are called bites, which are bispecific T cell engagers. And this was presented last year at the annual hematology meeting in the US. And this is a very early trial. So they tried to figure out what are the doses and they only used, they used less, they treated less than 10 patients. And these patients all had like four or five rounds of treatments before. So they're highly pre-treated. So these are hard to treat patients. But it's interesting, Lee, that it's interesting that a complete response was achieved in two patients. And, and, and this gives hope that this kind of treatment actually is another therapeutic avenue of exploiting the immune system to kill off leukemic cells and to make it responsive again against leukemic cells. So in summary, um, the standard treatment is, three plus, is three, 7 plus 3 with a consolidation of cytarabine. For elderly patients, it's slightly different. This is, and this is where fitness comes into place. So that's where we have to think about other treatments like, um, like azocytidin or lotus RSC. Allergenic stem cell transplantation is a curative option also for elderly patients. So age does not preclude you from this. It's mainly fitness and, and disease status. So it's really important to determine the AML subgroup so you can have specific treatment inhibitors such as FLAT3 inhibitors. Lots of different drugs have been approved within the last two years, way more than, the, than a decade before. So this is really promising and there are more treatments on the horizon. So, so AML, the outcome, these 20% I've shown you, this will increase, this will get better. And most importantly, I think AML should be treated in clinical trials. <coughs> Excuse me, the reason is, that first of all, you can monitor how patients do. Second of all, you can try new things in comparison to standard treatments that have been around for decades. And third is that you eventually improve treatment in a systematic way. And this is very, very important. So my last part is the research part. And I just wanna give you an insight of how research works and what are research goals. And I'm talking mainly about my research, which is supported by the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. So this is an important aspect. And this kind of research, it might be early at some points, but this is the way how the community shares results and then tries to figure out new treatments and, and push them towards patients. And this is important. So the first research approach is that we take leukemias we screen them, we basically look very closely what is happening in a single leukemic cell and what is wrong and to understand. And then we find something that is, for example, compared to a healthy cell is different. Then we try to look at it and we call it preclinical models. Basically, it's animal models. It's a little bit like, you know, McDonald's relabels um, fried chicken to crispy chicken. It's the same thing, but we call it preclinical models because it sounds a little bit more friendly, but eventually it comes down to animal models and one has to be realistic about it. And from there, we want to move this, if we understand the function, we want to move this into a new treatment. The other way is to, and, and this is something I also try to do, I see patients being treated with, um, leukemia patients being treated and I see, okay, it doesn't really work. And, and then to figure out what is the problem, what is the clinical problem, why doesn't it work? And then you move, go back to science and, and try to address these clinical problems with like state-of-the-art science to understand the problem. And from there, you go back to the patient to improve the treatment. And this could involve, for example, resistance to a drug or also side effects. And I think that's the other research approach. But to make this happen, both approaches, you need to have a good knowledge, knowledge exchange. And this is only possible if you work at a research facility like the Terry Fox Laboratory and they're extremely smart people who, when we talk about things, we exchange results, we discuss it and we're very critical. But on the other hand, you have the hospital, you have the Leukemia BMT group, for example, these are like the best doctors in, in, in BC, BC for this topic. And we discuss research, we discuss clinical problems and this exchange makes it, makes it happen to establish a research program as you can see here. And so, and this is something would we do. So we combine this. So we have these preclinical models here where we develop new disease models to actually recreate a disease in an animal model, helping us to understand, to develop how the leukemia develops. And this will help us to develop and to find new drugs. And these new drugs can be tested then in these preclinical models and eventually brought into clinical trials. On the other hand, we have clinical trials here 
just the clinical research arm. And from here, we can look at, okay, does it work? Doesn't it work? Is there resistance? Is, is there no resistance? And try to improve that too. So this is the work, how research works. This is the, the way it works. And this is how we can actually find new results and bring them to the people in, in, in Canada. And this is not only limited to BC. To BC. We have Canadian cancer, the cancer conferences. So this is a good way of sharing thoughts and eventually advancing treatment. So my final summary, AML is a complex disease with many subtypes. So it has a lot of different phases and you really have to figure out what's AML. I, I cannot even stretch this enough how important this is. You can really have to figure out what subtype it is. One treatment doesn't um, fit all patients. So you, at the end, we want to have tailored treatments for each subtype and also based on the patient's fitness and expectations. There are new treatments coming along. So, so really research has, has opened a lot of different avenues to create new drugs and companies are working hard to bring them to the market. Treatment should be done in clinical trials to evaluate new drugs. I think this is really important and to make them available to, to Canadians. And I think the key to really advance and to increase survival rates and quality of life for AML patients is combining clinical and preclinical research. And this is the end of my presentation. And I really hope you could, you can better understand how the disease evolves, develops, how you classify the disease, what are treatment options. So I was, I couldn't present everything, but within this limited time, but I just want to give you an idea how we approach treatment of AML and eventually what is the future and how we imagine to actually create a better environment, to create a better treatment for the people in Canada. And I thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Kugenbauer, for shedding some light on AML, diagnosis, treatment, and research as well. It was extremely interesting. Um, we will now take some general questions. So please remember to use the question or chat function uh, on your panel. Uh, you, we will not be able to hear your voice, so it's really important that you use uh, those methods. I do have some questions that had come in throughout the uh, presentation. Uh, so the first one is, I'm an identical twin and had AML and a bone marrow transplant. Is my identical twin more likely to also develop AML at some time because we are genetically identical? Mm, yes and no. It's, it's kind of hard to say um, sitting in front of a computer, but um, I have, leukemia is known as other cancers, is known to have, to be inherited between family members. So, so, so it can be, but it doesn't have to be leukemia. Like cancer is something that can be inherited and, and, and so do leukemia. So currently this is a huge, um, this is an, people do a lot of research on this and try to, to create family trees of how leukemia can evolve. And do you know, for example, that there are certain genes, if they are mutated by birth, so basically um, we call this germline mutations, if they are there, there's a, that there's a pre predisposition to, to the development of acute myeloid leukemia. So this is a good question. But you cannot, there's not, there are not really a lot of screening methods to actually predict this. Interesting, thank you. Uh, the next question, is it possible for AML to develop after radiation treatment from another type of cancer, say blood cancer, for, uh, sorry, breast cancer, for instance? Yes, it is. So um, we call these, these AMLs um, T AMLs or therapy um, associated or related AMLs. So, so every chemotherapy or radiation treatment, and I'm also talking about treatments, for example, for rheumatological diseases, which involve methotrexate, which is also nothing else than like kind of like a chemotherapy in a very light form, can cause mutations in normal cells, which eventually will um, result or can result. The, the risk is very small, but in, in, in different cancers. So when we talk about treatment-related risks, uh, we always talk to tell patients that if you receive chemotherapy or like a transplant, the risk of developing a secondary cancer, that's how we call like a follow-up cancer based on the previous treatment, is, is increased. So this is something you, ha you have to keep in mind. And that's why it makes sense to do routine screening approaches and screening investigations with your, with your doctors. 
Thank you. Uh, following question, how does transplant work in relation to matches? Say it again, please. So uh, it's, it's a bit of a longer question. So it's how does transplant work in, in relation to matches? How does that differ from a full match versus a partial match? Well, the thing is that, so the, so the best the best way is to have a full match. But uh, I mean, we, we are testing for like 10 different proteins that um, should match. So a full match is not the same as, for example, like a, like a, syndrome, like a, like a twin brother or sister. So this is not the same, but the less there's a match, the more there's a risk that you have side effects such as uh, chronic versus host disease, GVHD. So this is uh, graft host disease. So, so this is this is something that develops with if there's not a perfect match. Um, and this can cause a lot of side effects of your treatment. So that's why we always thriving for the best match. That's what we try to figure out. However, um, there's more and more research ongoing of how to optimize if there's not a match. So for example, the most difficult transplants were the ones where we had a half match, which we call the haploid identical transplant. And with a new method, it's actually an old method, but it was rediscovered with, it's called post-transplantation post cyclophosphamide. The outcomes of these treatments, which were really bad and, and feared, are actually really good. So that a lot, quite a lot of centers, especially in areas where, um, where you have mixed ethnicities, um, they prefer often haplotransplants because you can find a donor faster like you can take family members, for example. So that's why um, people are <coughs> people are not that scared of it anymore. But on the other hand, you still have to keep this in mind. I think this is important. It's a good question. Excellent, thank you. Um, interesting question here is: Can a child of an AML patient be tested to see if they are at risk for AML? Hmm. In theory, yes, but um, it's it's. Um, but if you go to your GP and say like I want to, or like go to the hospital and say like I want to be tested for that, it's it most likely it won't happen. Somewhere along the same lines as well is, um, do we know what causes APL or AMLs? Is it exposure to a virus, chemicals, or is it really genetic? So there are a lot of factors that can cause it, or like at least that they can contribute to the development. And one of the most prominent factors, and which was figured out relatively early, was actually radiation. Um, so after, so for example, Marie Curie, who, who received two Nobel prizes, she um, she experimented with a lot of radiation and she developed leukemia. Um, a good but very sad example is the um, are the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So a lot of people after that developed leukemias, and this was um, well recorded. So so this was living proof and, and catastrophe. It's it's horrible, but it really showed that the incidence of leukemias, and I'm not only talking about AML, um, rose dramatically in these regions during that time. Other factors are, um, we always look for, for example, cancers like asbest exposure. These things can con contribute to, um, to the development of blood cancers. So there was a really interesting article um, a few years ago where they looked at firefighters that went straight into 9-11, into the Twin Towers when they broke down, because the Twin Towers at that point in time were built with a lot of asbest. And these firefighters were exposed to asbestos, and there was an increased rate of multiple myeloma, for example, in these firefighters. So they could really show this connection between asbest exposure and, and the development of blood cancers in, in, in this population. So, so there are different, um, it's, it's known that there are exogenous factors that can trigger that. The other thing is there are viruses, um, African viruses that, for example, can trigger lymphomas. This is also known. So, so it's, it's a really good question, and, but it, unfortunately, it's a complex answer. So just to bring down, there are a lot of different factors, exogenous, disease factors, previous treatments that can actually predispose you to, to the development of, of leukemias and blood cancers. Thank you very much for that. Um, I have another question here. So what are the symptoms of a CML developing into an AML? 
Mm, usually this is this is something so so first of all um you will see um certain dynamics in terms of your blood counts so usually blood counts especially white blood counts rise hemoglobin's levels drop and also platelet levels drop so so this is these are the kind of the lab symptoms when we monitor these patients we realize oh something is wrong but on the other hand, I mean, the, the, the symptoms are very similar to like the clinical symptoms to what we see in AML patients. It's fatigue, it's like easy bruising, it's maybe some chronic infection you cannot get rid of. So it's very unspecific. But considering that you know that you have CML, I think the, the making this connection is, is easier than from somebody who has, who is, for example, was healthy beforehand. Thank you. Um, someone is asking, what are the physiological um, symptoms of progressing AML? Basically, they want to know if they would actually feel that or if it's something that happens at a cellular level. Can you repeat the question, please? Yes. Uh, so someone wants to know, what are the physiological symptoms of progressing AML? Uh, is it something that's physiological and felt, or is that mostly on a cellular level? Mm, so... It depends a little bit. So if you, let's say you, um, let's say you are on treatment and, or like you had treatments and are, um, you know, complete remission, the symptoms are unspecific because again, your, your blood counts are off and you, and you develop anemia, which is fatigue. You develop maybe infections, you develop bruises. Um, you can also develop B symptoms, which we call like weight loss or night sweats, chills. And I mean like real night sweats where you have to actually change your pajamas. And these are like the classic, like the body symptoms. This is what you feel. You feel that you're off. That's how patients usually report it, that they are like, something is happening. I cannot also concentrate well anymore. I'm constantly tired, something off, and then they go to, to their doctors. So, so this is how it presents. Again, it's very unspecific which makes it sometimes hard to make this diagnosis of a rare disease. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Another question is here, how do you monitor patients who completed treatment for relapse? Is there any specific tests for it? Um, so this is a really, really good question. And this is something where there's a lot of research ongoing. So we call this topic MRD or minimal residual disease. So let's say you would, you know, which AML subtype you have. And I will go back in my, if you remember this, this slide where we can, um, where I showed the different AML subtypes, there's this AML NP1 mutated group. And this NP1 gene, you can actually monitor so the levels in the blood and different centers do that. And this is something we do where we do research on in, in here at BGH in British Columbia. In Germany, it's more popular. A lot of works came from Germany. Basically, is you take peripheral blood, and if you have this specific subtype, you can measure the levels of this protein and then um, of the RNA in the cell. So it basically gives you an idea. It's, it's actually not the protein, it's the RNA of leukemic cells, it gives you like an idea of the leukemic cell load. And if this is increasing, you mean this also shows that um, your leukemic cell count increases. So it means that your leukemia develops dynamics or becomes and increases. So, and then you have to, have to do something about it. You have to do an intervention. So this will guide our treatment. But this is not a standard because there is, unfortunately throughout the world, there is no like standard method of doing it and a standard method of like saying, okay, this is a cutoff for treatment. This is, if it's below level XY or level 100, for example, you don't have to be treated. If it's beyond 100, you have to be treated. This is not existing yet. And that's why this has to be, and there's a lot of research going on, but this is the future. We will have in the next few years, we will have extensive methods of monitoring disease activity even after treatment. Very interesting, thank you. I have a two for one question here is, can a child be a stem cell donor and what are the probabilities of an adult and child donor match? So um, if it's so if it's parent match, if it's the actual child of somebody who is has leukemia, then it matches half, right? Because the genes of the child are coming from mom and dad. So and if, let's say the dad is sick and, and asks for the child to be a donor. 
then it's it's only a half match. So it would be a haplotransplant, which is possible, and which is which people have been doing. But um, usually, from what I know, is the so there is not an there is an age limit. So we say I think 16 years or so is is an age cutoff for being a donor. But this this depends a little bit on the circumstances. Thank you but, very much. Yeah, so so that's Sorry. the go right ahead. Sorry about that. Go ahead. No, no, but this is like, for example, could be a cutoff, but this depends on, on region, country, and center, how they handle this. Thank you very much. Um are there any treatments or maintenance for complete remission from, from someone who's been in complete remission? Well, so um, so there there was, um, so in Germany, we had a, quite a few clinical trials where they treated patients, they got an induction treatment, they got a consolidation, and then they were put on a maintenance treatment. However, this maintenance treatment is was, even though it was low dose, like in comparison to the consolidation or the induction, it was quite toxic and it didn't really show a benefit so um so so it was put on hold so people usually get an induction and then a a consolidation or like a stem cell like stem cell transplant as a consolidation or part of the consolidation however nowadays with more drugs coming down the road that are less toxic but still efficient this is going to be revisited where people where actually clinical trials look into this again if maintenance after even stem cell transplantation can prevent relapse better. So this is a good question. But it's it's highly investigative. So so that's that's another reason why, for example, you should participate in clinical trials because of to figure out is this helpful or not. Absolutely, thank you. Um so someone here said a drug was given to increase plasma before the stem cell extraction. Would the drug given to the donor possibly create cancer in the donor? What was the last part? If this drug creates problems within the donor? Correct. So a donor was given, someone who was a, a stem cell donor was given a drug yeah. to increase plasma uh, So before the extraction. So this drug that was given to increase plasma, could that cause cancer in the donor? I'm, I'm not sure about plasma. Like, so the, the, what we give donors to mobilize stem cells to bring them from the bone to the peripheral blood. So there, this is an ongoing debate, but there is a lot of long-term observational data that shows that there's not an increased risk of developing, for example, leukemia after stem cell mobilization. So, and and the other things, if there would be the slightest idea, like hint, um, we we wouldn't do this or it wouldn't be done because our highest priority is to protect the donor who is a volunteer who doesn't know the person in most cases and our and they do it on free terms so our highest um like it's very important for us to protect the donor so if there would be something we, we this, this wouldn't happen we wouldn't use that but there's long-term observation data where basically this was precluded thank you very much I do believe I have one more question. Um, so I, again, there's there's a lot of questions about whether or not these uh, AML is considered genetic and whether it can be passed down from family member to family member. Um, yes. Again, uh, maybe you just clarify that one more time because I'm I am getting quite a few of those. So, so uh, just to, to summarize. So. Well, it, it is known that, um, so so in general, it is known that cancer can be inherited. So if you look at, so we always ask patients when they come to our clinic, what is there a cancer running in the family? And it's quite surprising how much there is actually that maybe a brother had lymphoma. Now the patient presenting in our clinic has leukemia or the mom had breast cancer or the dad had colon cancer, the mom had breast cancer, the kid has now leukemia, the other kid is healthy. So there's, there's, there's a lot of... Um, I think inheritance is, is a big factor of um, how leukemia or if leukemia develops. So this is, is very important. However, there are very um, few tests you can do. That it is possible, but you cannot really um, say, okay, we do a test and now your risk of developing leukemia is 70% or so. This is not existing. So, and that's why, and then um, 
if this would be the case, for example, let's say your risk of developing leukemia is 100% um, because you have this genetic mutation, then we would maybe offer you a stem cell transplant and do it to healthy people, but this is not the case as a prevention. It's kind of a little bit like this. I mean, this, this was, this was um, highly discussed when, when, when this Angela Angelina's Julie story occurred and she made public that how she, she dealt with her predisposition to develop breast cancer. And we had a lot of discussions about this and I think this was an important discussion to, but right now we don't have like a good test to say like, okay, your disposition, like your, your risk of developing cancer is 50%, 20%, whatever, it's, it's not there yet. But people are looking into this. It's, it's not something where, uh, it's, it's actually a really interesting research field. Excellent, thank you. Okay, let's see here. Okay, I don't see any newer questions. However, if there are any questions and you have asked them, um, please uh, please note that I we will do our best to reply to you uh, via email as well. Uh, so please do not hesitate to contact us or to write any further questions via email and I will gladly do what we can to answer those for you. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Celgene is our sponsor for making today's webcast possible. Thank you so much for everything. Um, I'd like to just thank Celgene, our sponsor for making today's webcast possible. Please do not hesitate to contact us if you need any more information by email or at canadainfo at lls.org. So if you do have any further questions, please do not hesitate to email us and we will do our best to get those answers for you. Um, also make sure to check out our website regularly for the dates of our upcoming webcasts or to watch all our past webcasts. Uh, please note that a short survey will be sent to you all participants after this webcast. We would greatly appreciate you taking a moment to fill it in as it will help us to offer you the most valuable information in the near future. So thank you every mu very much for everyone for joining us and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much, Dr. Kuchenbauer. Yeah, it was a pleasure for me. Thank you again for joining and listening and, and asking questions. This is really important. It was a good experience. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good day, everyone.